we've taken a journey through the federal. We've talked about the various uh, other avenues uh, of uh, and perspectives on water. Then we uh, we heard from some of the the higher um, views on water from some of the top CEOs. Then we walk through a, a, a successful case study, I think, of um, of a budding water business. Then we moved on to how t solutions and how technology can solve some of them in water, then how academia uh, can be part of that. So here in our concluding panel, I wanted to sort of end it with uh, some real success stories and, and hearing directly from some of the individuals that have made it happen in the water space. And uh, this is in appropriately titled Successfully Building and Growing a Water Business. Um, some of them are in the utility space, others are not, some are in treatment, but um, I think it's an exciting panel to end with it, that it's possible, we need to do it. There's some great success stories of some great leaders that are sitting here on the stage right now that have done it and will continue to do it. And hopefully their words and, and their sort of um, plans can be replicated uh, many, many times over because I think a common theme has always been there's a lot more to fix than we can do it. There's, you know, so um, with that, I'm going to introduce... Uh, our panel, we have uh, Henry Sharabay, who's uh, the CEO of Seven Seas Water Group and been in the water space and had several successes building um, large scalable business in water, mostly on the treatment side. Um, not gonna go too much into the Josiah, I think we, we uh, in his background, we heard him talk for a while. Hopefully we'll hear him talk a little bit more, but um, Josiah Cox. We have uh, Zach Sato, uh, who is the CEO of KMX Technologies. Uh, probably one of the, the younger businesses here, but certainly uh, a budding success story and more on the, the technology side of, of water. And somebody, frankly, who gave me the first report on water several, several years ago when he was an equity research analyst at Barclays. And then we have uh, Mirka Wilderer, who is the CEO of Denora Technologies, uh, one of the larger European water uh, technology treatment uh, purification businesses. Uh, running that massive platform, and and we'll we'll share that, and then moderating it is uh, Damien Giorgino, who um, has seen, observed, interacted with, and now uh, continuing to to help grow many of these water businesses, uh, moderating the panel. So with that, I'm excited to to end the day with this panel, and I'll pass it off to uh, to Damien. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Um I think one of the most exciting things about being in the water space for the last 20 plus years is to see it evolve. And it really has evolved. Uh, 20 years ago, I was fortunate enough to be uh, uh, at the beginning of a company called US Filter. Uh, when it first acquired uh, the businesses that started it, it was a pink sheet traded company. And I stayed with US Filter until the end uh, when we exited to the French. And we went from 10 million in revenue to about six and a half billion and run rate revenue in eight and a half years. Uh, it was done through organic growth, it was done through acquisitive growth, and it also took a lot of capital. And so when I look at what we did back in those days, the excitement that came with success, the excitement that came with uh, company building, um, I still continue to play in that space. I've done two other public companies. We did a SPAC back when nobody could spell SPAC and uh, raised $432 million. One of the things I heard that was pervasive in today's discussions is, are, are you able to create in a relatively quick fashion that sort of success? And what do you need to create that success? Um, I play in the space because I, I firmly believe that that's where the, the market is, that water is a pervasive, uh, investable theme. Um, I think part of what you're seeing, you will see on this panel, is there's great management team, there's great technologies, there are great business opportunities out there. Uh, success can be defined a number of ways, most often, and rightly so, it needs to be based on a return. But to get to that, you need a lot of different elements. And what we're gonna talk about today is how you put those elements to together in a practical way, probably hopefully this session will be the most practical out of all the sessions about how you actually build a company. And these four you'll find are, are very uh, successful in building their companies. And uh, we're gonna just plow right into it uh, with respect to what it takes to become a, a successful water company. Now, just real quick, um, you'll find that the water sector 
is a fascinating sector. What you didn't hear today, I don't think, Alex, the succinct story of why we invest in water. Water is a billion dollar market, or excuse me, a trillion dollar marketplace around the world growing at triple GDP rates. People want to invest in it because it is, there's no more water on the face of the earth since time began. Yet we continue to make more and more demands on that, that natural resource. That trillion dollar marketplace runs from water as a natural resource through to point of use with the bulk of it being on the industrial agriculture and energy side of things. So it's a fascinating market to be in from an industry dynamic. It is a very complex, however, uh, business to be in. Um, at a trillion dollars in growing, you can't be a player to, to every market. You can't supply everything. Yet the business models that are evolving uh, take more and more responsibility and accountability for their equipment, for their solutions, for their services, and the customers are demanding that. So um, that's my, my precatory comments. Um, so I'm, I'm gonna throw it out to you guys. We talked a little bit about um, some of the themes that, that uh, make for a successful uh, water company. And each of you are in a different phase in your, in your evolution. Um, the first thing that I think you need in the formula for a successful company is capital. So I'll, I'll throw the capital side of it down to you because, you know, what, what's the old saying? I've never heard a company go broke from having too much equity. Um, so I'll throw it out to each one of you, Josiah, first, about your capital, how you deploy it, how it's obtained, and, and how it fits into your strategy. So the regulators actually say I have too much equity. Equity, just know that. <laughs> so I'm, I'm literally getting dinged for that right now as we speak. So, no, I mean I, I think we hit on earl earlier. I mean there's a huge interest, obviously, as evidenced by this room, of people who want to get in the water space. You talk about how the size of it, but then coming up with a clear strategy where you can deploy capital, I think, is one of the really difficult parts of this business, right? Because there are so many assets, there are so many barriers to entry. You've got to explain how you navigate all those, and to find patient capital is very difficult, right? So once you solve for that, then I think, you know, it really becomes easy. The first capital I raised was very, very difficult, and the last capital I raised took, you know, 12 hours. So it is, a, you know, it's a, it's a graduation, and especially you know, success breeds success. So in Denora Water Technology, is a family-owned business. So we are lucky to have uh, that background for uh, capital raising. Um, but I would agree that it's the strategy that really matters for me. Let's try this. Ooh. <laughs> it's the, the strategy that really matters in terms of capital deployment. Um, and for us, it's always a question of where around the world and what part of our portfolio. Um, so Seven Seas Water Group, I think to your, to your uh, question and to answer, is successful because I think we found the perfect solution of providing actually water as a service, uh, which is an ongoing asset ownership of the business, uh, serve our customers, but also have the backing of Morgan Stanley Infrastructure Partners. So, uh, we have about a dozen or so desalination plants, more than 160 wastewater treatment plants, and we only deploy capital where the customer truly values it. So rather than having to build the business based on technology or a startup, we have the ability to actually deploy the capital into the solution and make a return on based on what we offer, which I believe ultimately to the customer is important that they get a solution and solve their challenge rather than whether they have a single double pass RO or what kind of filter is inside. And I think that's the best use of capital when it's part of the corporate rather than going outside for project finance or doing an EPC. I think combining the two is one of these solutions in, in the water business. And I think having had a chance to, to meet with Alex, I think a little more than a decade ago to start talking about this, I think back then nobody heard about the term decentralized water and wastewater solutions. I think we've come a long way. And now if you combine that uh, financial um, acumen with the decentralized solutions, I think especially in the United States, that's the uh, key to success. KMX is a very unique technology company. It's a very unique high-end water technology. And as a result of this, we're able to deploy uh, a very capital efficient business model, two different business models. Uh, one is a lease model, which, which 
which we've recently partnered on in, in one of our core markets in the energy market, on oil and gas. Uh, so extraordinarily capital efficient for us. The second is a long-term lease model where we look to leverage uh, capital from project, uh, project finance partners. So high-end technology, capital efficient, and a partnership approach. That's really how we go about thinking about capital deployment. And it's, it's fascinating that each one of you has a different equity component to you, right? Your, your, your cost of equity is different. Just size in a you know, private equity back, but it's a, it's a growth equity fund, essentially. You're in, inside of a public enterprise. Uh, you've got an infrastructure fund, and you've got some, some uh, early stage uh, capital as well. Um, so it's fascinating that the, the, the comments that you have are matching up your risk profiles with the capital, right? Because everybody trades at a, different, at a different multiple and everybody's cost of money, we all assume, I think that the cost of money is fixed, um, but it's really risk adjusted. You know, it's, it's, it's a, a function of the efficient frontier and where you want to play in that. Um, how, has, how has that affected your business strategy, the type of equity has it, has it caused you to go in a different direction than otherwise? Or uh, did they buy into it and you've kept on that, on that same uh, momentum? Uh, Zach, you want to go first on that one? Yeah. Um, KMX is a growth company. So, it's a, um, so the, the, the equity value today, the equity value in the future uh, is very valuable. Uh, our perception of the equity of the company the, the various stakeholders' perception, including the team, uh, the scientists, the engineers, the commercial team, uh, the current investors, uh, as we continue to hit commercial milestones, win new projects, enter new markets, uh, there is extraordinary, uh, there's an extraordinary growth profile around this technology as it penetrates new markets and takes market share from the existing solution. So the, the way that we think about the value of our equity is extraordinarily different than the way that a mature water company might think about it, their cost of capital. Yeah, I think it very, very much uh, affects how we deal with it. I think I'm, I'm a strong believer in, in the golden rule. He who has the gold makes the rule, right? And in this case, it's the capital. So I think knowing exactly what your value of capital is and where it comes from definitely decides on the strategy. So obviously, uh, Damien, you mentioned uh, Seven Seas is owned by an infrastructure fund. There's a clear horizon on how long an average infrastructure fund holds an asset, and therefore the strategy that you go after has to be reflective of that strategy and, and the risk you're willing to take, but unfortunately also the speed. And I think what's most important when you talk about the capital structure is the time component. Uh, Josiah spoke about uh, you know, uh, patient capital, but I think it's clearly the value of money has a lot to do with how long are you willing to hold the asset and what can you achieve in a short amount of time because four or five years in the water industry is, is a nanosecond and that very much then uh, determines what type of strategy you can go after. Yeah, and from our end, it's been very interesting while we're part of a family, we've also had various different minority ownership, Blackstone that sold to an Italian utility called SNAM, and just recently in June this year, the IPO. And so that has certainly been also reflected in how we adjusted um, from our, our strategy from a, a strong growth focus under the Blackstone years to a more steady and now very reliable focus within uh, being a public company. Yeah, I'm, I'm on my third round of capital formation, and it has been radically different than what the value of equity has been between different partners. You know, start out with the California venture capital firm. They very much had the uh, turn and burn flip mentality, the proof of concept, then we got to graduate. I uh, went to a family office. It was great for flexible capital and rapid deployment, but obviously had a very term limited, you know, portion to it. Like, if there's only so much capital available, you need to find your last partner. So, you know, Partnering with Scions, for myself in particular, has been a huge win because it's the, it's the hybrid model. Like, hey, we're still private equity back. We have those type of returns in mind, but we also have a long-term view of how those returns are, are going to come about. So, you know, each one of those investors has affected my decision-making, obviously. 
No, it's interesting. Um, I wish Patrick Decker were still here. Uh, and you're living it right now. We talk of private equity about you know three to five year time horizon, that being very short. Quarter to quarter is what public companies have to deal with. So I'm not certain how, how patient that money is or how permanent, it may be permanent, but it isn't very patient. Um, one of the other elements, we're moving on, we've got various themes we wanna talk about that make success. Talent, um, team members, makeup of your team, how that evolves, how you get involved with that and what that means. And with part of that, and we talked about this as a group before, how geography might affect that, your, your market. So Mirka, if, if you wanna take the first one on about the, the team and then, uh, you know, we've had a lot of discussions about the geography because you know, we're, we're kind of US focused on this, but we hear a lot of, a lot of uh, companies that say the US market is a very you know, uh, a hard market to penetrate, sometimes difficult and long life uh, to get assets uh, deployed and, and markets change. All right, two really good questions here and both uh, something I'm really passionate about. I think the team is the number one driver for the success of building up that enterprise value. You need a passionate team that, that goes out and, and drives uh, the strategies uh, to turn that, um, that success. Uh, for us being um, around the globe, uh, being a diverse team is really important. And, and I think in, in general, the water space would benefit from more diversity. I keep saying if we ask the same people the same questions, we're gonna get the same answers. So if we wanna have innovation, we need to start asking different questions and ask different groups with different backgrounds and diversity of thought. And so being a, an international company, we have the luxury of having um, members of our team from Japan, China, through the Middle East, Europe, and then US and Brazil. And that naturally gives us, at least from a geographic perspective, a more diverse um, footprint. What's been really interesting for me uh, to see is, you know, we, we started out with uh, North America, the US being our strongest region, followed slightly behind by Asia, and then uh, a distant third was actually European, although we're a European-owned company. This has drastically changed in the recent years, where now Asia is my clear um, growth region, has surpassed the North Americas by far, and I have to say, I'm also very impressed by the activities I'm seeing out of the Middle East. So uh, we're, we're not seeing the same growth rates here in the U.S. as we see in other parts of the world. Are you finding that, that, that what, does regulation play into that at all, do you think? Or, or is it that the markets are, are quicker to adapt over there? What do you think those, those differences are attributed to? Well, I want to go back to your initial start of the question, the team. I find that, you know, we, we grow with our challenges. And what I'm hearing from my team in Asia and in, in, in uh, Europe is a real strong can-do attitude. There's a different world. You know, we were all thrown up over with COVID and other challenges that we've seen. And just the ability to pivot and, and see a business opportunity therein. Where, where I hear more comments of, you can call it excuses or complacency from the, the side of, of the ocean. And Henry, I'll, I'll throw it to you next. You've, uh, you've got assets in the Caribbean, you've got assets in the US, uh, you've taken over now, you have a team. How, how does that all uh, flow into success? Well, I think Merck or summarize, it's all about the team. And I think at Seven Seas, we had to challenge that over the last year, we had to rebuild the senior team. And um, I think it's very important. I, I'm a strong believer that a diversity is strength. And diversity does not necessarily come from gender or from um, a color of your skin, but it comes from a background and in, in, in diversifying or questioning the status quo. Uh, what I think is, is the worst thing you can see in the water industry is we've do it, we're, we're going to do it this way because we've always done it that way. I'd love to have that challenge. I'd love to uh, have a team that uh, is challenging each other intellectually. And then ultimately, once that door to the boardroom opens is on the same on the same page and I think creating an environment where people are questioning the status quo doing the best for the company and not for themselves um, I think that holds true whether it's in the US and and we are I think lucky to be able to draw from a pool in the US of diverse candidates uh, because we are a melting pot and so people come with back different backgrounds and or you find that same advantage also when you go abroad so I think ultimately you know I spoke about the golden rule earlier there's no way you can execute a strategy or build a successful business if you don't have that team that is there to ultimately stay, uh, be incentivized to stay and uh, be retained to really go the extra mile. Because at the end of the day, let's face it, 
you know, uh, reverse osmosis system or wastewater treatment is not rocket science. What really makes a difference is how we approach our customers, how we deliver that, and how we then put the finances together. And that can only be delivered if you have the right team. Zach, with a with a younger company, how does that how does your talent pool is that is that easier or harder? I mean, I would think that a lot of folks would love to be in a smaller environment, a growth oriented environment um, that creates its own challenges, certainly. But um, how, how are you finding it? Well, let me let me back up a minute. We founded KMX two years ago, but the underlying technology has been developed over a 15-year period by a core group of scientists, and it's gone through multiple generations of technology development, multiple different uh, uh, commercial applications, and we find ourselves today with a very unique um, high-end application in the energy markets with a market application for lithium, which is lithium concentration. This is lithium that's found in brines. Also in oil and gas, treating complex oil and gas wastewater, and a number of other markets as well. The core team, particularly the scientific team, having worked together for over a decade, having them work collaboratively with the commercial team and hit some of these growth markets that are unfolding right now, like lithium, and responding for our customers, that's what's been really impactful. Getting the commercial team and the technology team working in step. Uh, hiring people hasn't been a major issue because of our unique position and having a lot of the core team in place is around technology. And we've been lucky, we've found great commercial people. Um, getting them working together has been, uh, has been a huge um, opportunity, and then that's been our focus, and then I, and I think we've done a great job with it. Zaya, you've you've uh, started small, gotten relatively large. Um, how is the talent acquisition, talent management, team uh, centric approach? How has that evolved as you've been as you've worked through these issues? Well, I couldn't agree. You know, any more with the other people here on the panel about how the team is is key to everything, right? So we're market disruptor. So we're, you know, we're doing way more deals and way more geographies than any of our competitors in the investor owned water and wastewater utility world. And really, for us, from a talent standpoint, we've deliberately not recruited out of the water industry, right? So less than one percent of my employees are previous investor owned guys or have previous experience in the water industry. Because I'm, I appreciate what you said down there, Henry, about you know you get the same you're going to get the same answers, you get the same. Oh, we don't know what's going to come next. We've all done it, done it this way, so we've we deliberately you just hire really talented people and really focus on hard work. We're a really hardworking company. I mean, it's a lot of hours, it's a lot of travel, all of that. So we've self-selected for that, and that's been a, a key part of our success is find these kind of driving personalities that want to make a difference and are willing to learn a new industry. That's an excellent point. I mean, we hear a lot about losing the talent that you have, the graying of the water talent. I can remember we were doing U.S. Filter 25 years ago that we looked around and said, geez, these are old water buffaloes. We can, we can handle this. And you know, now that I may be getting close to that age, I'm looking at myself and saying, I don't think I'm that water buffalo. I think it's a very exciting time right now to be in the, in the water space. I think the water space is something that, that transcends a lot of the themes that most companies go through or most markets go through because it's so diverse. You know, you start with water as a natural resource and go the whole way through. Um, and, and Henry, I'll, 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 I'll take the next piece of this uh, to you. We talked a little bit about the role of technology. And technology, you know, is everything from, you know, the, the technology you have right now, the technology you could deploy, and how that would how that, that would mature your success or accelerate your success. Yeah, I think technology, and I think uh, Patrick Decker, again, you mentioned him earlier from Xylem, I think said it. I think uh, in the common practice, in the common public, people are waiting for the holy grail that can solve all water and wastewater. I think we have it. I think the number one problem we have in water and wastewater is to find the financial solutions to bring it to those who need it the most. And innovation, in my mind, is currently the vehicle in which we can bring it to the customer. And again, uh, obviously, focusing on what I've been doing first as a public company or a private company, then public, and now with seven Cs in, in a fund, is is to find decentralized ways of uh, build own operate systems. 
and whether um, you know it has a, a xylem component in it or a de Noir component in it, with all, a lot of respect, or another component in it, the customer ultimately cares that they have a reliable, safe water or wastewater drinking system. We talked a lot in a typical water conference about all the things that are wrong and bad with water. I think what we're doing on this panel is all the things and great solutions we have to fix all that. And it is not necessarily technology, it's not necessarily innovation. Yes, that's part of it. To me, the innovation and the way to bring it to the customer is ultimately to package it in a way that they can afford it, that we can use, especially in the United States, public funds to ultimately extend the timeline with private equity to really solve those problems because we have about $1.8 trillion of backlog of water and wastewater treatment that cannot be solved by the Build Back Better plan or by one or two private investors. That can only be solved if we take a holistic view and combine the two and bring solutions uh, to the customer that combines innovation, combines technology, but ultimately, you know, in my mind, offers a decentralized uh, build and operate uh, scheme. That's an excellent point. I think uh, today we talked a lot about what was bad about the space, but there's a lot of good going on. And I think whenever I look over the last 25 years, what we started with when people didn't know what the water sector was, was it clean tech? Was it a utility? Are you raising money? It was, I mean, try raising money for water 25 years ago. It was a, it was a challenge. Um, I think it, the focus is now, and, and I think it was uh, John uh, Regas who talked about the headline news in water, and everybody goes after the headline news in water. They don't really understand the marketplace. The headline news is nasty. You know, 20 million people a year die from waterborne illnesses or lack of water. That's horrible, right? It's not where you're going to invest your money. That's for a government to do that. And this, what we're trying to do is 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 provide a mechanism by which you can provide water and 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 make it a successful company. Um, Zach, I'll throw I'll throw that 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 question to you next. Once again, we're in a unique place where we're looking at um, um, new markets. Um, we're looking at the opportunity to recover critical minerals in waste streams. It represents a whole new path forward for a growth opportunity for the water treatment space. Lithium, bromine, calcium chloride, magnesium, there are so many valuable minerals in wastewater, in waste streams. Uh, depending on the geography, the industrial treatment process, um, different ways to extract, um, isolate, concentrate these minerals that are found in low concentrations. And the cost does matter significantly, and the cost is a factor of the technology. We are focused on continually driving down the cost through technology improvement. And as a result of that, uh, technology innovation and continual improvement uh, is very important for us. And I think that you're going to see uh, a pivot in the years ahead in the water treatment industry to be more of a revenue generating driving sector uh, for some applications in some industries and not just uh, a cost center. So I think there's going to be new opportunities, um, new growth markets, but only it only comes with new processes and new technologies. Do you think, um, and I'll, I'll throw this out to both you and Henry, do you think your companies are water companies, or would you define it some other way? We're an industrial technology company. We're an industrial, KMX is an industrial technology company with a powerful cross-cutting uh, technology. What we do is we separate, KMX separates water from salts, minerals, particles, that could be lithium, it could be salt, it could be calcium chloride, it could be a number of different things. Um, and it, so it depends. It depends if we're, if we're uh, concentrating salts on the back of a reverse osmosis plant, or if we're concentrating lithium from its natural state to bring it to a place where it can be converted to battery-grade lithium. We're an industrial technology company. Yes, we are a water and wastewater treatment solutions company. We, I think Zach is absolutely right. The future will change, but I don't think it will change the delivery. 
I think ultimately what's the intel inside will change and will have an effect of how we deliver it, but not what we deliver, but not how we deliver it. So yes, Seven Seas Water is a water and wastewater treatment uh, company that solves the problem and, and, and gives people access to safe, reliable, fresh drinking water and takes care of their wastewater and reuse. And Josiah, we, we talked a lot today, there are a number of panelists today that talked about implementing technology, not necessarily treatment technology, you know, some AI, some IIoT, and other solutions. Um, how has that uh, implemented or affected your business? Uh, yeah, I mean, because we're running so many disparate utilities over such big geographical areas and state locales, I mean, remote sensing technology, remote monitoring stuff, I mean, that's kind of the first pass of investment we do because we have to know what's happening. I mean, it's shocking how bad the records are out there. You know, we've got water wastewater systems that people don't know how much water they've withdrawn for decades, they don't know how much wastewater they processed. They don't know where their pumps are. I mean, it's kind of crazy stuff. So we can see ourselves kind of converting, you know, 40 year old utilities into a modern utility and then using technology to efficiently deploy capital to fix the, exist the issues as exist today. And without that technology, we wouldn't be able to run these many utilities. I mean, it's really key to our success. Yeah, so I think one of the key elements is to recognize that we're serving modern day customers and, and we all use these phones um, as part of our daily lives and need to recognize that our customers are expecting the same. I think when I think about technology and innovation, I actually think that you know, while we are driving innovation on our core product that we offer, the real innovation will come across the entire value chain of a business. Um, and it's a fun of it. How can we use these digital technologies to provide more value to our customers as they use our technology? And we're seeing a, a lot of great use cases from how we deploy technology internally using AI to help us around the world better advise our customers because we've seen similar problems maybe somewhere else in the world. And then being able to provide our customers better answers around their unique problem, which is still seen somewhere else in the world. So I think there's huge benefits of uh, the digital transformation in, in ways of always thinking about it. How does this drive value for our customers? So it's just shifting gears slightly, as you look at uh, the future of your business and the growth opportunities of your business, there's obviously organic growth, there's geography growth, there's acquisitive growth. Uh, the mix in your current businesses to make your business successful. And I know time changes and, you know, we can't talk about acquisitions without talking about, you know, portfolio theory and divestment. Um, but how, how does uh, the acquisition and growth and geography fit into your business plan for the future success? Well, I mean, we're a pure M&A company, so, so we're doing nothing but consolidation. So really oh, great answer. Great. I love yeah, M&A. There we go. You know. I've only done about 500 of them in the water yeah. space, so it's okay. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, that's all we're doing is buying these small utilities, you know, all over the place. I think for us, geography matters a lot. We pick the states we're in uh, because they're the highest amount of fragmentation with the highest amount of environmental noncompliance. So the state geographies we're in, we're really trying to solve the issue as it exists today. So that's really driven where our investment goes. And then a regulatory environment we can live with, right? So, you know, as a regulatory environment changes, then we, sh we pivot. You know, for example, you know, for years I said I would never go to California, right? Well, California's changed their water consolidation policy over the last year. There's a ton of work to be done there. And here we are signing contracts in California. So really, we're, we're willing to pivot, you know, based on the, the market conditions as we see today. Yes, yes, and yes. So... <laughs> We, we actually think of our strategy as part of the ends of matrix, existing markets, existing portfolio. That's where we scale the business by better integrating it, making sure every office and, and facility around the world can sell all of our products. That's huge growth potential if I wouldn't even add anything to it. Then we're thinking about new markets. What new countries can I go into with my existing portfolio? How do I go in? Do I acquire someone locally? Um, to speed up the process, or do I build up a team there? And then, of course, also new portfolio. What are adjacent technologies that we can add on around the disinfection portfolio or filtration portfolio to, to get to more advanced solutions and, and provide these technologies, again, that access to a global platform that we can then use to grow business. So it's all three. Yeah, absolutely. I think the main component, again, for us is time. So uh, the only way to get to certain growth rates in the water industry is through acquisitions, unfortunately. Having said that, I think we had 
We are the company with the first P3 uh, model in the city of Allison, Texas, where we provide a 16-year brackish water treatment plant. I think that organic growth path uh, for public-private partnerships in the U.S. for water as a service is the way to go organically in combination with an inorganic growth plan that obviously includes for us water as a service for industrial clients where you own the asset and allow them to um, shift that off their balance sheet. But yeah, our, uh, inorganic growth is certainly part of what we have to do in order to get to that um, short-term success uh, that we envision. And Zach, does acquisitions, I would, I would assume, include technology, uh, whether it's a company acquisition or a technology acquisition? Yeah, absolutely. We acquired all of the IP and all of the assets as part of the founding of this company. Uh, we evaluate new opportunities all the time. What we're focused on is market penetration. We always look at build ourselves, go at ourselves at it, partner, and I suppose as we grow, buy. The lithium market is our core focus today. And that's really been unfolding in the Wild West-like environment. Depending on whose growth estimates you're, you're, you're looking at, it could be growing anywhere from 10 to 40 times over the next few decades. Extraordinary growth. A complete land and technology grab is underway currently in the lithium market. We are able to move fast, work with lithium companies, and enter into long-term contracts with them to deploy our technology and proliferate it in that market. Completely different than oil and gas. Very large, mature market, um, uh, facing structural decline with large incumbents. Uh, very difficult for us to run around and knock on all the doors of the oil majors and, and have them incorporate our technology as part of their, their existing operations. So what we've done in oil and gas is we've partnered with a market leader, which is Tetra Technologies. Tetra will recycle about two billion, uh, they're expected to recycle about two billion gallons of water this year. Uh, last month, we licensed our technology exclusively to them globally in the oil and gas market. They have seven uh, recycling facilities in the Permian Basin right now. They're building more. Um, great customer adoption for their suite of port for their suite of uh, technology and processes, and they're a great partner for us. Very different than lithium, clearly. So we think about this powerful cross-cutting technology that has a number of different end markets and applications through that lens. Do we partner or do we go at our, our do we go it our own way? And uh, we'll take it on a case-by-case -case basis. I think we're about out of time, but um, thank you folks for being here. I think, and we've got some questions, I believe, Alex, but I think we, we don't do ourselves enough justice to talk about what's wrong in this space because the, the market space and the opportunities exist and they are accelerating in my mind. I, again, I've been in this space for a while well, the way things happened previously to where they are now, there's a drastic change. It's still hard. It takes a lot of hard work. I don't think anybody on this panel would tell you it's easy, um, but it's worth it. Uh, and I think at the end of the day, we'll see a lot more successes, whether it's technology, operations, financial structures, or, or new things we haven't even thought of that make it more efficient. So, Alex? Uh, so thank you. I think we, we've run out of time, uh, but thank you to you and, and all the panelists. Mm -hmm.